Excellent. Excellent and exciting presentation. A little bit of history. Um, I have been familiar with the work of the UCLA Philanthropy and Civic Engagement class since it was founded in 2012. And one of the good things about COVID, if there was any, was that the Zoom was offered, the class was offered on Zoom last spring, which allowed me to attend all the class uh, sessions and see the progress that the students were making in terms of uh, analyzing the organizations and selecting the three recipients. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce our panelists today, uh, three of which, three of whom are here. I think uh, Angela had to log out, but she'll be joining us back. But so my I'm pleasure. Here. There, you, oh good you are. You must be on a different screen then because you relogged. Okay. <laughs> so our speakers are Professor Jennifer Lindholm, who was involved with the creation of the class in 2012, as has been leading the uh, teaching team for the last five years. We have Joni Perez, who was one of the students in the class last spring, and will talk to us about his experience in the class and working with uh, another one of the uh, recipients of the grants, which was uh, Jazz Hands for Autism. Then we have Angela Sanchez, who happened to have been one of the students in the first year class with Jennifer, and also has had a long personal involvement with School on Wheels, which was the recipient of the grant that we will uh, highlight today. And the final speaker is Charles Evans, who is the current executive director of School on Wheels. So Jennifer, it is to you. Thank you, Emery. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much, uh, Helena, and, and everyone for this wonderful invitation to share with you uh, a bit about a class that is near and dear to my heart for a lot of reasons. Um, my involvement, as Emery uh, referenced with the course, began in 2012 when our then uh, Vice Provost and Dean for Undergraduate Education, Judy Smith, who I'm sure many of you know well, uh, appeared in my office and said, hey, we've, we've got a, a new project to work on. Uh, I said, oh, what is that? And she said, well, I just got off the phone with uh, some people in Texas at what has now become uh, the Philanthropy Lab. And she said they offered us some money to develop a course on uh, philanthropy for undergraduates. And I said, oh, great. And uh, she said, so we've got a lot of work to do. I was like, okay. And she said, you know, we're gonna teach the class in the fall. Uh, and keep in mind, those of you who know Judy, this was, uh, I think early August that she had gotten this call. So she's like, you know, hey kid, you better find out some, uh, some resource information about the history of philanthropy because we're gonna need it. So that embarked us all on this adventure. Uh, we did go forward teaching the class in the fall. Uh, and why did it have to be in the fall? Uh, because Judy was retiring on 12-12-12, and she wanted the first offering of the course to be right as part of the close of her official duties at UCLA, which, as you know, then extended for many years beyond that. Uh, so we taught the first course, uh, and uh, it was just an amazing adventure. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, it's been a lab course, not in the scientific sense, but in the sense that it is an open forum for ideas and discussion, uh, debate, visitors, et cetera. And we taught that first course and learned a lot about what went well, what we needed to work on, how we could construct this uh, amazing experience, which was essentially that the Philanthropy Lab had given UCLA $100,000 to teach this course. But the key was that the course was not to be using the $100,000 to create the course and so forth. The $100,000 was for students to be able to give away to local nonprofit organizations. And we specifically organized the class in a way that we focused on Los Angeles area nonprofits because we wanted the students to be able to get hands-on experience interacting with some of the amazing people in LA and surrounding neighborhoods uh, who do this work uh, across the board in the areas of arts and culture, education, health, et cetera. Uh, and so that is the general focus. Um, each year we teach the course, uh, there are between 40 and 50 community partners. Uh, you'll meet today Charles Evans uh, in his capacity with School on Wheels. Uh, they are one of roughly now 100 organizations over the past nine years that have been involved with this course. And uh, it's really, as I said, just quite an adventure. Um, when Judy retired, she continued to teach the course for a number of years. 
And with the arrival of our new vice provost and dean, my portfolio administratively changed a bit. So I was less involved with the course for a couple of years. And then as life unfolds and things turn out, uh, I was asked to uh, provide leadership for UCLA honors programs, which houses the honors collegium. And Judy at that point was transitioning into a role working as the founding dean for the Herb Albert School of Music. Uh, no longer was it viable for her to teach the class. And for the first time in two years, it was very viable for me to offer a permanent home for it in honors programs. So that resumed my responsibility for teaching the course. And we've offered it every year since. Um, over the course of the course, uh, I'm sorry, over the course of the, uh, um, the offerings, uh, UCLA through this class has uh, awarded almost uh, $800,000 to local nonprofit organizations. Um, we do $100,000 each year. This past year, we fell a bit short. Uh, the group had $80,000 to work with. Um, but it is just an amazing experience. You'll meet uh, one of our very recent past graduates of the course, Johnny Perez, who was in our first ever completely online offering of the course, hopefully our last. Uh, and he uh, will tell you a little bit about that experience. But the real heart of this course is the students. They are just absolutely tremendous. Um, they apply to be in the course through a competitive process. Uh, kids from all over campus, the College of Letters and Science and the professional schools take the course. And we have around 25 students each year who partake in this. Uh, so I'll defer to the students to tell you more about their experiences. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being here. And I will turn it over to Johnny, who is going to be graduating uh, this coming spring. He's a psychology major uh, with a focus on brain and behavioral health. Uh, and he also has a specialization in computing. Uh, so Johnny, you want to share? Yes, thank you so much, Jennifer, for the introduction. Um, you know, right off the bat, when I talk about experiences from that class, I have to really say unique because there's never been a class that I can think of that has that's been offered anywhere else at any of my community colleges because I am a transfer student or even talking to my other friends who um, transferred to different colleges like UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, where they really had a class that was similar to this. It was a very unique experience overall. And, you know, just going into the organization, um, one of the requirements for the course was that we actually had to be a representative of the class and engage with one of the organizations directly and then be a, um, and then go ahead and be a scribe or an individual who would back up another, someone else who was going ahead and speaking to another organization directly. So my own experience was I was given the honor of talking to a place called Safe Place for the Youth. And it was just overwhelming to hear about these organizations, you know, what they're able to contribute, what they're able to do um, with, within their own organization. And, you know, hearing other students talk about the organizations, it really became quite a challenge to decide how are we going to decide on which organization really moves forward? You know, from day from the second week, we had to go decide on cutting out a specific amount of organizations and then limiting it down over and over and over until we came down to the final three. So beginning that process really requires civic engagement, which was the title of the class, philanthropy and civic engagement. And one of the key takeaways that I learned specifically from this class wasn't so much about what I have to offer, so much of what I have to say, but rather what other people had to offer from their own opinions and taking that in into consideration when deciding on voting which organization to move forward. And I just want to, you know, note that even within those discussions, you know, it was very challenging because sometimes we saw things that might be fit um, in one area, probably not the same as priority for the other area. So, for example, one of mine that I wanted to talk about was something long term. You know, I, I wanted to have an organization that we picked that we knew was going to go ahead and move forward long term and it wasn't just going to be, you know, a one time donation or a one time giving, but something that I knew that they were was going to be, I wouldn't say revolutionary specifically, but something that can definitely change the game, something that I knew can contribute um, scientifically because I am a psych major. So thinking about my background as research, what is something that we can go ahead and fund that I know will make an impact, not just in the short game, but in the long term. And that's why we ultimately voted for Jazz Hands for Autism because we knew that organization was offering something online that was going to cater to individuals you know, with autistic backgrounds and it, was, and it was something that they were looking at, not adapting just here in SoCal, but adapting across the world eventually, something I thought of long-term right away. But had I gone into the course with just this closed mindset with an idea of, you know, I'm just going to talk about what I want and not really have to listen to what other people have to offer from their organizations, I don't think I would have voted for it. 
but just having that just that idea of just being open-minded to what other people have to talk about was one of the best things that I have to I have to really commend about the course. And you know, one of the things that I talked about in my application was, you know, a long-term goal for me is to open up nonprofit treatment centers. As a psych major, going into my PhD um, in two years, taking a gap year for research, one of the long-term goals is to open up treatment centers. And what better way to really get an understanding of what philanthropy looks like than being on the other side of it? You know, what is it that they have to go through? What do the discussions look like? As to, you know, some of the guests that we were offered um, that, were, that spoke within the class, you know, we were really given a, real, a unique perspective that I will personally take as very valuable because not a lot of students can say as an undergrad, they had the opportunity to, to take a course that offers some sort of perspective as to what I know is going to be valuable down the future. And the last thing I want to talk about was my role as the convening director. Um, there were two of us, it was me, um, Layla and Brandon. And, you know, we were given a really tough, um, I think Jennifer can probably go and agree with this too, probably one of the, the toughest duties of the entire course, which was how do we facilitate this voting system? You know, at the end, everyone's emotional. You have three groups that have three organizations that they all, you know, um, determined to be the best to present forward. How can you go ahead and limit down, how can that limit, but how can you go ahead and facilitate a conversation that is going to be able to determine an outcome between first, second, and third place. You know, after um, just you know negotiations with among the three of us and just lots of talks, you know, we, we were able to set up a really nice system for voting, and and you know taking, I think the best thing that we um, Anne Marie had told us about, especially with our last discussion, which is what we aimed to do was taking all the experiences, whether it was readings, and um, discussions, prior discussions that we had in the class. You know, having students to go ahead and remember what those discussions look like in order to facilitate a conversation that ultimately I would I would say kind of flawless at the end of determining first, second, and third place because of the discussion that we had um, as to remembering what is philanthropy, you know, what is civic engagement. And my closing thoughts is, you know, that it's such a broad question, something I talked about in my letter that I wrote to next to this upcoming year's cohort, which was, you know, what is philanthropy? And one of the things that I talked about um, within that letter was philanthropy is something that's always evolving. It's something that's always changing. Something that might have worked in the 1920s and 1930s is going to go ahead and move forward and change through discussion, through civic engagement. And they go, yes, it's always nice to have nice to have a foundation of philanthropy was, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But just know that due to discussions and engagement that we have in the class, just something small like that can actually change and contribute to what philanthropy will look like presently and in the future. So I wanna thank all of you for on the time and letting me just offer my perspective. Thank you, Johnny, that was fascinating. Uh, yeah. Now, Jennifer, you wanna introduce uh, Angela? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so Johnny is one of our, as I said, most recent uh, participants in the course. Angela Sanchez, who you'll hear from now, uh, is one of our inaugural course members. Uh, she graduated, I can't even believe this. It was in 2013, it must have been, right? You were a senior that year. Uh, and she was a history major with minors in English and in education studies. Uh, I should say that the class attracts such a wide range of students studying so many different areas. Uh, and that's one of the things, as Johnny alluded to, that can make it a really interesting set of discussions and sub-discussions because the participants come from so many different backgrounds and often with, as Johnny alluded to, very definite ideas about how money should be spent. And what they learn to the person across the years of the course is there is very rarely a right clear cut answer. And the one hard and fast rule we have for their deliberations is they cannot decide to divide the 100,000 up, 33,000, <laughs> you know, 33,000 and 33,000. Uh, we want them to make the tough choice of how are you going to, you know, manage these resources. And I'm sorry, they're all great, but you may not divide the money exactly equally and throw in an extra penny here and there to make sure it's all equivalent. So Angela had that experience when we were just putting together the class for the first time. She has done amazing things since leaving UCLA. Uh, and one of my favorite things, Angela, is your authorship of Scruffy and the Egg, which I remember you sketching out plans for while you were still a student at UCLA. So without further ado, I will uh, hand this over to, to Angela. 
Thank you, Jennifer, and so good to see you. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Angela Sanchez. Uh, pleased to see uh, a few of you again. Um, as, uh, as Jennifer said, uh, excuse me, as Dr. Lindholm said, uh, <laughs> um, I was uh, part of cohort one back in uh, fall 2012 and um, class of 2013. I also got to work with Jennifer in the capacity as um, her grad student supporting uh, the evaluation of future iterations of the uh, philanthropy lab as well. And um, one of the, well, um, since then, uh, I went on to get my master's in student affairs and then have also uh, spent the past six years of my career working in philanthropy. Uh, I worked for uh, ECMC Foundation, which is a national funder, uh, which was up until March 2020 was typically based in downtown Los Angeles, uh, reporting to you from my home kitchen now. And uh, since then, though, uh, ECMC Foundation was growing from its transition as a scholarship organization to being a national funder. And so I, as their program officer for their college success team, I went through the very real process of developing a strategy, a theory of change, and um, in many cases, making uh, the, uh, the pre-screen before any of our grants grant candidates went to our board in terms of thinking about how much um, should a grantee be allocated? Uh, how are we thinking about where we're investing? We have a limited budget every year. Where do we want to make sure that we're placing those dollars? Because at the end of the day, we wanna make sure that students from marginalized backgrounds are able to persist and complete their college degrees. So um, really a lot of this work came full circle between my background in student affairs and getting to work with the UCLA Philanthropy Lab. Um, I also got to work with a Bruin, some of you may know Peter Taylor. So um, all of this definitely culminated into a very interesting experience that really did inform a lot of my work and practice. All that being said, I did not start out as a pretend millionaire. Um, in actually, I'm coming up kind of on the anniversary now. In November 2007, at the onset of the Great Recession, my father and I lost our home. And we were evicted from the only home I had ever known. I was in my junior year of high school, so 16 years old. And at the point when I was getting ready for applications to the UCs, the CSUs, um, taking SATs and ACTs and everything else, the acronym. And we were served an eviction notice that said we would no longer be living in my home. Uh, about one week shy of Thanksgiving, officers knocked on our door and we had our locks changed. The thing that always sticks with me from that instance was when an officer brushed by me and said, excuse me, ma'am. And the only thing I could think was, ma'am? I was 16. I, I couldn't vote yet on any policy that said my dad and I had to leave the only home we'd ever known. And so in that instance, it became very clear to me that when people hear the word homeless, they don't think of kids and families. They don't think of all the nuances within the population of people experiencing homelessness. However, organizations like School on Wheels do. And so while my father and I um, would spend the next um, almost two years bouncing around between motels called winter shelters and eventually landing in a family shelter, one of the breaths of fresh air was School on Wheels. When we wound up at a family shelter, um, I noticed that there were volunteers who would come in and they'd sit down, they'd work with students, and uh, they, they would come in like once a week or so. And I was curious, you know, who are these people? And so I went over and got to speak with the volunteer coordinator at the time, Natasha Bayes. And she explained to me what School on Wheels was, asked if I needed a tutor. I was doing okay, not so bad. A few months later, I started my senior year of high school. And I remember coming back to the shelter that evening and looking around for Natasha, the volunteer coordinator, because I needed a tutor. And um, I, full disclosure, as you all heard, I was a history major. I was not designed for AP calculus. <laughs> and so uh, I immediately hunted down Natasha and said, hey, I need a math tutor. She was so excited to help me because I'd never asked for a tutor before. And so she said, okay, uh, well, what kind of math are you doing? And I said, calculus. And she goes, oh, okay, give us a minute. We'll find you somebody. 
And they didn't just find me anyone. Uh, they found me a grad student in astrophysics from Caltech. And so I literally had a rocket scientist helping me with my math homework. That was amazing because my tutor also didn't just see me as hashtag homeless kid, but also as a girl who had lost a lot of things, namely her home. My sense of privacy, permanency, personalization, all these very basic tenets that come in with having a home that we all usually take for granted. And he also recognized that I had hopes and dreams and goals beyond that too, thinking about going to college, thinking about my career. I'd never really thought about grad school until he started talking about it. And I'd never seen a college campus. I never seen what UCLA looked like until I was enrolled here. The first time I saw a college campus was thanks to my tutor who took me around Caltech. And so that is a kind of life-changing impact that School on Wheels does with its volunteers. Um, and so since then, I remain very engaged with School on Wheels. I'm still in touch with my tutor who's um, wanna do his postdoc at Princeton. And uh, he's now currently a uh, faculty at NYU, very smart guy. But in looking at the difference that School on Wheels makes, I started a student chapter at UCLA and because one of the biggest impacts that um, School on Wheels had made it on me in terms of thinking about, wow, college really is more than just a pamphlet. It's a real physical thing. I could see myself being here. We started out with a simple tour of UCLA for a handful of students. And then our volunteer base grew. And then our number of students grew. And we were able to manage two sites that we were visiting as well. UCLA sits in um, school, one of School on Wheels' 11 regions, uh, the West Side being Region 3. And so there's a wealth of opportunities to get involved. Tutors can be in person. We're just starting to edge toward that right now. Uh, tutors can also volunteer um, online and through digital tutoring. We also have a literacy program that has been developing over the past couple of years. And in seeing the intentionality with which School on Wheels works with its students, that's what really honestly helps break that cycle of poverty because you are bridging one, um, one individual's care and actual support for a student experiencing homelessness. And then on top of that, also breaking down the stigmas that our society holds so tightly onto. And so understanding that one shouldn't be saying the homeless because it's not a monolith. There are so many people who go through this experience and one in four of them is a child underneath the age of 18, average age being eight. So thank you all for one, investing in School on Wheels, looking at the work that we're doing, and also again, those connections that we're building, those, um, those relationships that we're establishing to really help our students who have the most to gain from an education. I've been talking for a bit, so I'm gonna pause there. Um, and I think that there is a, um, a video or a, a short bit of media to be shared. Oh, and I think I did forget to mention, uh, I am now also currently on the board for School on Wheels Inc. And if anyone wants to get involved, we go as
Thank you for believing me. Mwah. Thank you. And then now, Charles, it's your turn to talk about School on Wheels and your experience with the class. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, I'm always amazed at these little videos that we're able to make in-house, but um, <laughs> nonprofit budget, right? <laughs> so um, first I wanna, you know, Angela's great. And, you know, we're, we're so fortunate to have had the experience of working with her as a student, um, but she also didn't mention this, but Angela, when she was at UCLA, she also funded a club um, that we still work with today. So uh, that's great. And they recruit and they train their own volunteer students from UCLA, and then they in turn become volunteer tutors for School on Wheels. And obviously that was a, a part of Angela's legacy, legacy and the sustainability that she was able to create while on campus. So still, finding a way to give back while studying um, to, to get her bachelor's. So that's awesome, Evangela. But, you know, I think I came on kind of late. Uh, I emailed Professor um, Lynn Holm uh, after I think the email went to junk mail. And I was like, um, I'm a little late, but I'm like, is this still available? It seems like a great opportunity. And she's like, sure, like get the information in. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be one of the organizations selected. Um, I didn't really know what to expect going in. You know, I've worked with a few student groups before, but this group was like none other. I mean, from the very start, they asked some real serious questions. I mean, they kept asking why, and I'm like, can you stop asking why? But I mean, I think what they were trying to do was trying to get to the true essence of importance of the work, right? And trying to really understand as a group collectively what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. So, I mean, that asks everything from the day-to-day -day operations to how do we measure success, which again, I thought was just impressive for a group of students who really were trying to figure out how they can work with School on Wheels to figure out how we can use funding to really have an impact on the students that we serve. Um, we came up with three different funding levels, which was also interesting. Um, the first one was for the, the 50,000 and Angela, you probably should have worked with group. We probably would have got the, we probably would have got the first spot, but not, now they're here nor there, but we, we went for three funding, um, three budgets. One was for 50,000. Um, and that was really looking at a, a different program. Um, one of the things that we realized during the pandemic was that we needed to involve the parents a lot more in their child's education. Um, and we needed to just communicate with them a lot more in terms of what we're doing and how we're working with their child. Um, we realized that during a pandemic, the parents are essentially the first teachers. And it's really critical that a lot of our parents really didn't, you know, in some cases don't have educational level or even technological awareness to be able to support their child in a distant learning environment. So we really, you know, that was one of the things that we as an organization, and we actually came to that conclusion working with another group at UCLA called the UCLA Parent um, Empowerment Project. Um, and we surveyed some of our parents right at the start of the pandemic, just to, just to hear from them and, and to get their input on how can schools and organizations such as School on Wheels best support them. So we did that in collaboration from a, with a group from UCLA and that was extremely um, beneficial in terms of figuring out what we can do to kind of provide some resources to better support our parents. Um, the other um, funding that um, level that we went for was $25,000. And that was really just providing resources to our students. Um, as you know, or as you may not know, um, you know, in order to do distance learning successfully, you need a couple of things. You need a device and you need Wi-Fi. And the majority of our students didn't have either. So as an organization, we really made an effort to say, we're just gonna go after fundraising and really trying to get a device in the hands of all of our students, no strings attached. We're not asking for it back. We just wanna give it to them. Um, and we want them to, to own it. Um, because one of the things that the organization that we always try to do is really lessen the digital divide. And that was again, to provide our students with the tools that they need to be successful in school. And that was just another area where our students kind of fall further and further behind. So as an organization, we really kind of made an effort to get devices in the hands of our students. 
trying to deliver devices in the in in the in the um in the right in the heart of a pandemic was a little difficult, but we managed to somehow do it, um, utilizing volunteers, utilizing school partnerships, turning our offices into resource centers for parents to come and pick up devices. So we really just got creative because we realized that we were just, you know, one of the things that one of the messages that we always tell our team is that for the families that we work with, it's not easy. Their lives are not easy. They just go through so many difficult things and so many challenges. So why should it be any why should it be any easier for us to provide them with the resources and services that they need? So we have to also be creative and innovative as we try to provide services to these families. Um, so that was one of the things. So just year to date, you know, we've been able to give out almost a thousand devices. We gave out brand new Chromebooks, tablets. Um, and we also have a partnership right now with the city of LA mayor's office where we're distributing over 700 hotspots to kids throughout Southern California. Um, and the third level was just to provide modules, um, which was for $10,000. And again, that was to really provide support for our families, you know, making sure they understand what their rights are as a family that's experiencing homelessness, what services are out there. One of the things that came out of the survey that we did with the UCLA Empowerment Project was that, Parents just didn't know their rights. They didn't know that if they moved to another uh, zip code, that they can stay in that same school. They didn't know that they qualify for things like transportation or backpacks or any other resources that the school would typically require of them. So those were two of the initi initiatives that we focused on. But again, it was just, it was, our group was just, I, I mean, I can't brag enough about how amazing. I think our main contact was a, a young lady by the name of Brianna. And uh, she got me excited. You know, she just, I mean, she was just energy in the group. Like I said, they asked some really thought provoking questions. And I just didn't expect that, to be honest. But they really got down and wanted to have an understand of what our desires are, what our outcomes are. What do we want in five years? What is our organization look like in five years. So they asked some really thought-provoking questions, and um, I couldn't be um, it couldn't be more of an honor to participate um, in 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 um, in this process with the class. So I'm just thankful and grateful. I think more universities need programs like this um, because it is. I mean, for for I think for organizations that we rely on individuals. And I think as long as people understand that it takes, it truly takes a village and, you know, every dollar is significant, it really matters and it makes a difference. And I can just only hope that more students would follow the lead um, of UCLA and the other universities that are participating um, in this philanthropy effort. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Jennifer and Johnny and Angela, of course. Now uh, we have time for questions. So if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat and then I will call on you to, uh, to ask them. Uh, we have a first question from Marianne. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. So Charles, I think. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering where, um, where the students receive, other than online, where the students receive the tutoring. Where are there places? Because you need some a little bit of quiet, and you need some space. So, where what are the spaces that the students, uh, uh, you know, where they where they get tutored in their in at their homes or that uh, well, whatever they are, wherever they are in shelters, or are there places that are set aside for that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, prior to the pandemic, you know, we're called School on the Wheels because the wheels of the organization are the volunteer tutors. Those are, they're the heartbeat of the organization. They really, like Angela said, she said that she had a um, rocket science. She was talking about me. She just didn't want to name me. No, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not me at all. But no, uh, we, we, our, our tutors come from all different walks of life and they meet the students where they are. So whether the students, is, the students are living in an emergency shelter, transitional housing program, in a motel, we had several students this year, which is really unfortunate and it's heartbreaking to think of, but we had several students this year that reached out to us that are living in vehicles. Um, and we actually, in addition to providing Chromebooks, we also had to go out and purchase a lot of car chargers because if a family is living in their vehicle, they don't have a wall outlet to plug their Chromebook into. So it was, it was, a, it was a huge learning curve for us. Since the pandemic, we had to pivot. 
So all of our volunteers, all 850 of them had to learn how to become online tutors. Mm -hmm. And that meant our staff needed to learn how to train those volunteers to be online tutors. The good thing about our program was that we were really forward thinking. One of the things that we wanted to do as an organization was because um, what's inevitable is that, and Angela can probably speak to this, is that if it, typically when a family is experiencing homelessness, they're going to move. At some point, they're going to move. And if a student moves from Los Angeles to Long Beach, for example, that volunteer tutor might not be able to follow them to the new city. And we were already utilizing online tutoring because we wanted to keep that match in place. So regardless of where that student moves, we wanted that tutor to stay in touch with that family. So luckily we were already implementing online tutoring. So it was just a matter of kind of adjusting our program and quickly pivoting to provide tutoring to all of our students online. Right, and then just a follow on. So this training that the tutors receive, they receive it from your organization? Yeah, all of our volunteers, uh, they have to, I mean, it's, we, we really try to make our, prog our process pretty rigorous. Um, we're not any, for this generation, you know, all of the, the young folks on this call, I like to say that our program is not an Instagram program or our Facebook program. So you don't come and volunteer and take selfies and then post them on Facebook and then you're done for the day. We really try to have a commitment. Our whole thing is consistency. So our volunteers have to submit a pretty lengthy application. They have to watch an online orientation. They have to come to a training that used to be in in person but it's online and then after they become a volunteer they then have to come to a, uh, an advanced training so it's a pretty rigorous process so we typically really try to find volunteers that are going to be committed the last thing that we want to do is match a volunteer with the student that's going to be out of their lives in a, in a week or so mm -hmm. right thank you so much it's yeah, wonderful you. work you do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tara Brown, which I think is addressed to Jennifer primarily. Tara? Uh, yes. Are I you online? Directed towards Jennifer. Good. Oh, my question yes. was yeah. about the class. Go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> my question was about the class and, and how they get involved with the nonprofits. Is it just deciding how? and who gets the funding or are there other partnerships and what kind of partnerships might you be looking for? Uh, we're always looking for partnerships. There are a number of different ways that, um, you know, we can, I think, benefit the work of organizations and certainly their work can benefit the learning of our students. Um, I can share a couple of examples where we have had students who uh, provide feedback about why an organization was not selected to advance in their funding consideration process. Uh, for example, one of the things that many of our students today don't understand is why an organization wouldn't have a perfectly functioning website that is highly visually appealing. Uh, and Charles' comment about the Instagram struck me because one of the things our, our kids realize through this process is A, how much sometimes things cost. And a lot of nonprofits can't afford to go out and have a flashy website or a high tech Instagram account or pictures posted every few hours about what's happening because they're actually engrossed in so much other work that has to be the priority. And so in one particular case, a few years back, um, we had an organization and I know she wouldn't mind me mentioning, it's Kindred Spirits Care Farm. And there were a couple of issues that came up there. As you can imagine, students, as I said, come in with all kinds of different uh, values orientations about what should be the priority for funding. Uh, and sadly, for many of us who are animal lovers, whether it's domestic pets or, or farm animals, uh, that tends to fall low on the scale relative to some other admittedly very pressing topics. And so this organization was fairly new at the time. They did not have a particularly impressive website, but I had known about the work they were doing and was really impressed with it. And one of the things students had said in years past is they'd like to see more startup organizations. Uh, and they liked smaller organizations and, and ones that were just kind of getting the getting up and going. So we included Kindred Spirits and they were eliminated in the very first round, which is, is purely looking at the information available on the website and anything at the time that organizations had sent to us. And so immediately they were eliminated. And uh, th when there was follow up with me about what happened, do you have anything you can share? I went back to the students and said, 
you know, what would you like me to tell her relative to why they were eliminated? So it was all this, well, we didn't really understand exactly what they did or how the animals were beneficial for the students, et cetera, et cetera. And they gave very detailed feedback about what was needed. And I shared that uh, the organization was able to find somebody, not a student at UCLA, but somebody who was able at very low cost to help them with the website. A year later, they were back in consideration. And I should say that once an organization has been funded, so sadly for us, uh, Charles's organization and Angela's uh, investments in it will not be able to be eligible again for at least five years. Um, we've never refunded an organization, but since Kindred Spirits hadn't been funded, they were in the next time. And students, of course, had no idea this history. Uh, their website was not, I would say, award-winning, but it was a thousand percent better than it was with anonymous stories of how they had helped and so forth. And that organization, long story, story short, uh, ultimately received from that year's class one of the biggest grants that the class has ever given. It was like 49,000 and some dollars. Uh, so that was one example. We've had kids who uh, will go out and in that case, one of the, the things that they were gonna do with the money was to get a used truck to help transport items. One of the kids in the class happened to have great mechanic skills and he went with the organizers to pick out the truck because he was worried they weren't gonna get a good deal. Uh, and so he went with them and found a truck. Uh, then we have other cases where students have actually worked for the organizations. You know, Angela is a board member now for School on Wheels, but we have students who've done internships with selected organizations or they've gotten regular jobs uh, and have really been invested in, in that work. The last thing I'll say on that front is one of the things we actively have to do is tell the students they may not volunteer with the organization they visited or looked at online until the class is over. Uh, as Johnny alluded to, the students become very connected. In the first round, they have, you know, between six and eight organizations, they're supposed to kind of pare down. They have two that they look at online and write a detailed briefing for their peers. And sometimes just from that, but almost always once they've gone to visit, they are connected and a lifelong advocate for that organization. And they come in, this is the one we're gonna fund. And they get into the large board meeting at the end. It's like, wait a minute, oh my gosh, I had no idea there would be other such great organizations. So yes, they are involved in a lot of ways. We've had uh, a number of organizations ask, is there any way that we could uh, create some internships for students? We're looking to do those kinds of things through honors programs. We're not able to move as fast as we might want to on that. But if you have ideas for uh, organizations that you were aware of, uh, in the case of School on Wheels, I had no idea that an organization that Anne Marie or any of you were involved with uh, had been funded recently. Uh, I found them, I knew them of course, because of Angela. Uh, and I thought, wow, this, this would be interesting to have them in it. And like Charles said, the, the invitation went to junk mail and I thought, well, maybe it's a bad time for them. Follow up went to junk mail. I thought, well, it's not meant to be this year. And I think it was literally Charles, like a, the day of the class or the day before uh, that you said, oh my gosh, this went to my junk mail. And so we added them. But we are always looking for organizations uh, and uh, any ideas you have are welcome. Oh, thank you. It sounds like an amazing program. And just also the School on Wheels sounds like an amazing program also. Thank you both, everyone for sharing. Anybody else has any questions? Otherwise, Emery. Do I, who is this? This is Charles. I'm sorry. Oh, Charles, go ahead. I, gonna, I was just going to ask a question. I mean, um, Professor, we work with so many organizations, I, and I'm from South LA. I grew up in South LA, and um, I know of so many small organizations who can always, and I'm always trying to share resources like this with them. If there's ever opportunity for organizations like School on Wheels that have participate to just nominate or recommend any organizations, please do reach out to me so that yeah. we can you know, make some suggestions. If you're yeah, we, for we want suggestions now. I'm gonna be starting to invite um, uh, nonprofit partners. Probably, I usually start at December, early January for our spring quarter offering. The class will be taught again in spring of 2023. Any and all of you here and any friends, colleagues uh, that you may uh, feel would be interested in seeing more about how the class works, you're welcome to join us. Uh, as I said at the outset, it's a lab course. We usually offer it at the faculty center in recent years. Uh, and so you are welcome to attend any time. Um, I don't know if you have our, our class web address, but it's uh, www.hc123, so hc123, which is the course number, uh, .org. 
and that'll give you a sense. You can look at the syllabus and kind of how the, the layout of the class works. That would be a whole session to explain in and of itself, but uh, any and all of you are welcome. And as I said, if you have ideas and Charles certainly, uh, we would take your recommendations very highly. So uh, there's no shortage of, of great work that can be done. Uh, and we are really interested to do all of it. I saw Diane Childs had put a, a question in the chat about John McNeil and has he ever been involved with his class? No, he's not been involved with our class, but we had the great privilege of him teaching a collegium course for us for a number of years. Uh, and he shared through that course, his wisdom and generosity and brilliance with so many students and he is beloved and very missed. Uh, so he, he has been an integral part of the collegium offerings, which uh, by the way, if you don't know our interdisciplinary seminar style courses, uh, they are designed for our honors program students, but any students on campus are eligible to participate uh, during second pass enrollment. So we restrict them for first pass so our honors kids get uh, first crack at them. Uh, but we are looking to expand those offerings and I hope as part of that expansion, we'll have more philanthropy related learning that can, can be included. Um, so so um, Helene, uh, Helene had a question, which I think is also re re related to the question I was gonna ask, because uh, for the first time this year, the students uh, decided to have a value uh, discussion before their final presentation and decision-making. So it'd be interesting to hear, hear a little bit about that. So I, Johnny, do you wanna, articulate more about that, how that worked? Yeah, um, so one of the things that, um, this was part of the convening directors who decided on having this kind of discussion before the final vote. You know, we, we knew that the class was about civic engagement. We, and we knew that this conversation uh, for the final discussion can go a lot of different ways. We were afraid of uh, the conversation being led in a direction that probably wasn't related to the course because of how passionate students were about each of the organizations. So what we decided to do was right before we even had them vote, we had this, um, we were called mentee boards. And so what the students did was we asked them, okay, just right off the top of your head, list three things, three values that are very meaningful to you in an organization. And so what they did was they went ahead on the floor, so they filled it out. And then while on the Zoom, we actually presented all the different types of values that were on the Zoom. And so what, what this kind of brought up into the conversation was, you know, these are the type of values that everyone's looking into before we go ahead and give this final vote. You know, can, we, can each one of us discuss maybe one or two of them and explain, uh, you know, why, they meet, why they're important to you in an organization that we're going to vote on? And this led to a really good discussion. And ultimately, I would say probably one of the reasons why the voting at the end went so smoothly because of the fact that you I can give an example for me one of the things that I thought about was was about research focus which was one of the ones that I had personally written down but then you see other values that are on there like um like innovative for example is that one that came into my head you know it just starts to you know, again it, it it goes it goes ahead and gets rid of that closed mindset and has you open it up to you know what does everyone else think you know, this is actually a really good idea. I, this is something I want to consider as well. And so it just led to a really nice discussion and ultimately as to why we voted the way we did. One of the things I think just to piggyback briefly on what Johnny said that um, the class and the way it evolves every time, it's the same structure, but because they're different people each time, uh, specifically different students each time, uh, the discussion can go in very different ways from the work group meetings through the final board meeting. And one of the challenges for everyone involved, and I say that both for our teaching team and for the students, is that a lot of these visits and the work that the nonprofit organizations are doing and the emotions it triggers in students in many different ways, raise a lot of issues about what really matters to me and why. And one of the things we really strive to do in the course is to create a space where we engage with each other in difficult dialogue with respect. Uh, and that, as we all know, can be much easier said than done. And I think one of the most commendable things about the leadership the students exercise in the course is really making the effort on a daily basis when they're in, in the class to bring the best of who they are to those spaces. So we listen without judging to the greatest extent we can. We listen before we speak. We try to really hear what's behind people's 
passions and reasons for taking a particular stance on things. And I think in this environment that we've all been existing in, uh, it was not surprising that for the first time in really such a unique and special way, this course really got into a discussion of values, even from the very beginning. You know, what matters to me and what's my positionality? Why am I saying that this should be the priority? Uh, and so it's, it's really an adventure. And I, I think that any of us who've been involved teaching, and we had the great privilege of having Anne-Marie and another uh, friend of the course, Vicki Salman, who, because of the wonders of Zoom, could just log in each day. They didn't have to trek to campus if they wanted to come. And the students became so attached to their perspective and their involvement. Um, but we all grow through this process. I mean, every time we teach the class, I learn something new. I learn something different. I think differently about what we're going to do next time. And that's a credit to the students and all the energy and, and ideas and insights they bring. Jennifer, if I could piggyback on that answer a little bit. Do you, do you go back after the grants have been awarded to identify the accomplishments that have been achieved through that grant or do you evaluate the program that was funded to use that information for future classes? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, what we do, and it's yes with a qualification. Yes, we have each organization, I mean, each nonprofit that receives a grant a year later reports back to us with a grant report. Uh, and we have a group of students in the course who are responsible for formulating the questions that they'd like each grantee for that particular year to answer. Uh, and they're basically the same set of four or five questions each year, ranging from, uh, you know, please describe how you specifically use the grant relative to the purposes for which we had delineated it. And that's another thing, and Charles touched on this, the students don't just give a, you know, grant for use of any purpose. Uh, that has to be a specifically oriented, you know, project or activity. And so the follow-up then asks, you know, what exactly did you do with this? What were your successes? What were the challenges? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like if you were to get a grant from any sort of entity, you're accountable for reporting back. What we have not done and what I would really like to do, uh, either through a Fiat Lux class or a collegium course, is to convene a group of kids who want to be involved in evaluating long-term how those organizations have grown since the time they got our grant or since the time they were involved with the class. And that's an opportunity for learning about all sorts of things related to another dimension of nonprofit work. Uh, we haven't been able to launch those courses yet. So as with everything, you know, it takes time, it takes resources, et cetera. But uh, that would be another next step for this course because we have a lot of kids who are very involved in, in assessment and evaluation. And you can imagine kids from different disciplinary perspectives. One of the values that gets raised is sustainability. Uh, it's, you know, what do their, what do their assessments of their own programs show? Uh, and so we have nonprofits who are all over the spectrum in terms of what they are able to mount in terms of evidence that what they're doing works. So it would be an amazing, uh, you know, separate set of learning for students to, to get involved in that. Yeah, just actually a very quick kind of tag along on that. Um, capacity building is a, is a challenging um, metric to capture for a lot of funders. Um, and at the same time, general operating support grants are those that are most highly sought after by nonprofits. And we know that having fluid funding is really, it keeps the lights on, it lets a, uh, an organization hire additional staff, it lets um, people breathe a little more easily, and ultimately it makes a program better and more effective. But um, oftentimes funders will shirk away from general operating support because there is no way to measure it. And I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about the cult of scalability slash um, trying to, to measure everything. But I think that if students could have the ability just to look at the overall health and growth of an organization, that would be a very interesting place to take the philanthropy lab next. And now there's been a few years of track record too to look back at. Yeah, and, and we have just with us here on the call, a, an alum of the course uh, with a master's degree, no less, who has some assessment experience. So Angela, if you ever want to partner on thinking about those things, it would be great. Um, you know, it would be, it would be a lot of fun. And as Angela said, she was involved with me when I had to step back from actually teaching the course to work on the assessment component. And UCLA really led the way on that. Uh, Judy was always a stickler for, you know, evidence that things work. 
uh, and we are an alum of the philanthropy last, the class now, we UCLA, uh, in large part uh, because of the fundraising success and the generosity of local donors. Uh, the, the idea of the philanthropy lab, right, is that they launch these courses, different universities across the country. I think they've got these programs going now at 25 plus campuses all over. Uh, we were the first public university on the West Coast. Stanford was the first private university on the West Coast. Uh, and when organization, I mean, I'm sorry, when campuses get to a point where they are reasonably self-sustaining and generating uh, support, uh, they're turned loose. They become alumni of the philanthropy lab in favor of investing then in, in uh, schools that have not launched these kinds of courses. So uh, we have become somewhat self-sufficient and thanks to the Women in Philanthropy group who created a, uh, an endowment fund for us and we're actively working on building that, we're getting where we need to go. But uh, any and all ideas you have uh, about where we could take this course next, uh, we have a wonderful new Dean in the Division of Undergraduate Education who has been tremendously supportive. Uh, that's Adriana Galvan. And I know she's very open to thinking both in honors programs and beyond what we can do to really make our kids stand out uh, more than they even already do in terms of their excellence. So lots of exciting possibilities. Mm -hmm. A little side thing I dropped into the chat as well, because I think we're probably going to wrap soon. Uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, my picture book series, Scruffing the Egg. Um, I just threw in the links. Uh, I do sell on Amazon. If you want convenience, you can also uh, email me directly. <laughs> it's all the same. Um, but uh, just to be aware, um, this picture book series is specifically about homelessness and um, talks about the uh, experience of uh, single families experiencing homelessness, um, but through the lens of a cute family dog and a half hatched egg. Uh, so it is, uh, it is meant to make the discussion of homelessness accessible uh, to uh, younger readers, as well as for kids who are experiencing homelessness, um, a way that they can see their story represented. Uh, proceeds from this book do allow me to, I did independently self-publish, so uh, proceeds do go directly to allowing me to donate the book to shelters and organizations like School on Wheels, Inc. Um, I also go and do school visits um, and depending upon the, uh, the tier of the school, um, I'm able to make donations there as well or um, also set aside a few books for their libraries. Um, so just a little bit about that. If you want your own copy to share with family or if you want to designate it, um, I do all the above. Thank you. I did get two copies of the book and they're wonderful. And small children really like the taste of the cover. Yeah. There you go. And among her other talents, uh, you know, Angela is also an artist. She did all the illustrations herself for it. So, I mean, I, I, it just never ceases to amaze me the talents of the students uh, that we have at UCLA. Every time I teach this course, I say, you know, this is the best group of students that we ever had. Uh, and then, of course, argue with colleagues who's like, no, my students were the best ever. It, you know, it's, they're, they're just remarkable. I mean, we're just so privileged to, to be able to work and engage in this environment. So, anyway. and, and another thing about Angela, she's a magician. She, oh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> she's, she, uh, our, our, our bachelor's degree um, dissertation was on women magicians and she, yeah, you'll have to loop me back for a future session on that one. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Good. Is there any other questions? I think we still have some time, but if there's no other questions, I'll uh, give it back to Helene to close the meeting or anybody else. Okay. Well, I have several announcements, so, uh, so please stay with us. But I want to thank you, Anne-Marie, for a truly outstanding program and to our speakers especially for enlightening us about how each of us can make a difference. You are all clearly um, making great strides in helping organizations succeed. And uh, it was very inspiring to hear your stories. Um, so thank you all. Um, I first uh, would like to, uh, in terms of faculty women's club uh, announcements, I would first like to remind those of you who, uh, because it is membership drive month, um, I would like to remind those of you who have not yet sent your membership forms in and your dues yet that we are looking forward to your doing so, either online or by sending your form in um, that you received with your update newsletter. Uh, so just a reminder about that. Uh, secondly, if you know anyone who would like to join the Faculty Women's Club and enjoy the benefits of our programs and our sections, 
uh, please encourage them to join um, and also to visit our website, which is uh, available uh, online, the UCLA Faculty Women's Club at uh, .wordpress.com, or you can just Google uh, UCLA Faculty Women's Club and it'll take you there. Uh, third, our nominating committee chair, Betty Billet, has asked me to announce that the nominating committee, she is, uh, um, and her group welcome uh, nominations and recommend recommendations for nomination to the board of the Faculty Women's Club. Um, so you can send those uh, to Betty, uh, whose email address can also be found um, at the back of the um, update newsletter. Um, and it's in the executive board listing there. So please, we encourage everyone to um, Think of a good leader who would uh, be willing to serve on the executive board next year. Uh, fourth, I do want to mention that January 18th will be our next meeting date. And our speaker will be uh, Dana Katz and her team from Operation Mend. Um, so we really are uh, looking forward to hearing more about that wonderful program uh, here at UCLA uh, and put that date on your calendar, please. That meeting will also be by Zoom. Um, and we will continue our general meetings by Zoom until at least we are certain uh, that our April meeting will be in person and that will be our scholarship dinner. Um, so uh, that is the uh, April 5th, the date of our scholarship dinner. Uh, also want to make sure you put that on your calendar. And speaking of the scholarship dinner, uh, everyone uh, hopefully received the uh, scholarship donation forms with their update newsletters. Uh, and there are two ways to contribute to that scholarship fund. One is to send your contribution in with the form. Uh, the other is to go online. The form does direct you to how to make a donation online to our scholarship uh, fund as well. So I encourage everyone to do that. Um, and we appreciate your support. And that's about it for announcements. And uh, Anne-Marie, thank you for a great program. And thank you to the uh, Alumni Affairs for hosting our event uh, today on Zoom. We are uh, indebted to you for all the support to keep us uh, going, even in a virtual mode when we can't be in person. So thanks for the Zoom support and all the other support you give us during the year. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everyone.